At least five masked gunmen stormed the Garissa University at first light on Thursday. People fled in all directions. Students described how the men marched from room to room, demanding to know if those inside were Christian or Muslim. Christians were shot on the spot. I saw the attackers fully covered in some clothes, only leaving a slit for their eyes, says this student. When I saw that, I ran for my life. I got my fellow students together, opened two windows, put chairs down to help us jump out. A place of higher education. People seeking nothing more than the chance to improve their lives. Now 147 of them are dead, slaughtered by a group that is becoming possibly the most brutal band of terrorist killers in the world. But this happens in Kenya, in Africa, where most people cannot grasp why this is happening and why this is something the world needs to be aware of and ready to take on immediately. It's a pleasure to welcome back the president of the Iraqi Christian Relief Council, fellow at the Philos Project, an executive producer of the new film about churches and religious persecution, Sing a Little Louder. Juliana Tamarazzi joins us once again. Juliana, pleasure to have you back on the show, but always in such very difficult cases. Yes, but thank you. Thank you for having me on again. 147 people dead. They waited, they looked for the Christians, and then they executed them in front of everybody. However, we're now finding out that there was a warning the week before that this was going to happen. Why do people not take these warnings seriously, especially when they know there are people who will kill someone simply because they don't believe in their faith? What can people do, Ed? When the governments are not protecting these individuals, when local Muslims are not rising up to protect these individuals, rather they give them up. For example, in Iraq, so many locals, so many neighbors gave up their fellow Christians there. What can they do? We are taught, especially in the United States, that we must go on, we must live our lives. And we don't know how the attacks would occur. Uh, are, there, are they going to attack us in the malls? Are they going to attack us at schools or at churches? So we have to continue living. We can't stop. But it is the responsibility of governments and really the world community to start really realizing what is happening uh, against Christians and have a global solution. Currently, we don't have any global solutions like we did in battling communism or Nazi era. Then why do the Christians, and we've talked about this before, but why are they so minimalized by many of the governments when we know that there is an attack on Jews around the world, an attack on Muslims in certain areas of the world? We have all these faiths, yet the Christians all always seem to be basically getting the short shrift and no one pays attention. Why? Is this a hatred? Is this a desire to wipe out the Christian faith by governments as well? You know, there are some uh, prof those who follow prophecy, they say this must happen. But this is not an excuse. We as Christians have always been um, taught to love thy neighbor like you love yourself. And the world community Really, I've told you this before, Ed, I believe there is this anti-Christian sentiment that is gripping the entire world, and we as Christians becoming are becoming more complacent. I think Franklin Graham is my new hero. He's standing up, I call him the modern-day Jonah. He's standing up against this persecution so much more than our own president is. Even the Vatican has started standing up for this and really calling for uh, serious action so much more than our superpower, our government has done. This is something that we have to get organized, we have to become strategized to deal with this. But I've always said to you, Ed, we cannot do this alone. We have to come in unity with other groups, with moderate Muslims who are condemning this, but we have not been able to create a safe space for them to be able to come out and condemn these attacks. There are so many who are not pro these attacks in the Muslim world. At the same time, according to Bridget Gabriel, there's 300 million of them that are thirsty for Christian blood. So I believe as Americans, we have to, we have to be diligent. Well, there's so let, many let, let me dig into that diligence here for just a moment here, because as I noted, these killings happen in Kenya. If you were to go to most Americans, unfortunately, and you ask them to put a finger on a globe and say, where is Kenya? Most of them could not find it. That probably would be for a lot of the world as well. It is a world away. It's the other side of the planet. We don't think about it. Are we getting to the stage now? And do we have to understand that it will take Unfortunately, the execution of Christians, the beheading of Christians, the murder of them in Chicago, in the streets of New York, in the streets of Los Angeles or Miami, simply before anybody starts to pay attention. You know, I believe uh, Americans have 
become more aware and are starting to pay attention, but they're too afraid to say anything because they're going to be re uh, viewed as Islamophobes. And I gave a talk not long ago at a university where I brought some examples of how Muslims are rising up and standing in unity with us, but that's not enough. And the man who was there, the Muslim guy that was there, he said, you're not talking enough about the good that Muslims are doing. Well, there's not enough that I can talk about how good Muslims are doing. So this is why there are isolated cases where we're being protected by our neighbor Muslims. But it's still not enough. And you know what? There are homegrown or lone wolves out there that we have to become very careful of. I encourage the Americans to really watch our young people. If they're starting to become radicalized, they're not in hiding. They're our neighbors. They're our friends. If they start dressing differently, they start talking differently and praying differently, that is critical for us to start uh, witnessing and reporting that. I got about a minute and a half left here, so let me turn this a little bit to what also is happening in the region because you have generational ties in the Middle East with Iran, Iraq, the various areas as well. There is now a framework for a nuclear deal with Iran. Al-Shabaab, who committed these atrocities, they are connected to Al-Qaeda. Everything is all interwoven in one way, shape, form or another in the Middle East. Knowing what you know about Iran and knowing what you know about the fact that they are rarely able to tell the truth, how frightened are you that things will only escalate if indeed the Iranians are allowed free reign and they are not brought into tow by the Americans and other major powers? I am afraid because there is no real, this is a framework as uh, administration is calling it. So at any moment, both parties, either parties can walk away from this deal. And we have to wait till June and see what happens. But what is missing in here is the talk about Pastor um, uh, Saeed or the other gentleman who was, uh, who, who's been held in Evin Amir, who was a decorated soldier, American soldier, and two other Americans that are being held there. The human rights violation is escalating. Women are being stoned there. So as we're talking about these negotiations, who knows if there is covert operations that we're not aware of in, within Iran? And how are we going to hold them accountable? All, we have to wait till June and see what happens. But we, as human rights organizations, we cannot stop fighting for somebody like Pastor Saeed and others. Who but are you won't killed. trust them. You, you wouldn't trust them, correct, Iran? I, I fled that country, so mm -hmm. I'm very apprehensive with how forthcoming they would be. And we unfortunately, as you said, have to wait until June. We have to wait and see if the president indeed got it right this time around. The Iraqi Christian Relief Council, you do great work. It's always a pleasure to have you here on the show and to bring light to this issue. Juliana Tamarazzi, thank you for being here. Have a great weekend. Thank you. God bless you and happy Easter. To you as well. Happy Easter. A simple question. Do we need the United States Postal Service? And before you answer, when was the last time you sent a handwritten letter to someone with an actual physical stamp? It's coming up next on Midpoint.